all do be seated. We love it when much-loved figures from a TV series reappear. Did any of you watch Beyond Paradise? Yes. Oh, I guess a big cheer. I've not seen it yet, so no spoilers. But I do know that uh, it's D.I. Humphrey Goodman who's back, but he's in the UK and he's solving new cases in Devon. And I have it on good authority that it's a very witty series and I'm looking forward to catching up with a familiar face. I've also started watching season three of Picard, a spin-off from Star Trek The Next Generation. And I've been having great fun counting all of the big names from previous Star Treks who are re reappearing in the series. Well, Riker, Diana Troy, Seven of Nine, Beverly Crusher, and now Worf, the Klingon. That's everybody's aged. Worf now has got a white beard and moustache. Looks very, very kind of regal. Familiar faces in a new context. And our New Testament readings these past two weeks have been a little bit like this. Last week, Adam reappeared. This week, we've got Abraham. And if you were here on Wednesday, there was Elijah. But while the TV companies use loved characters in a kind of cynical attempt to get more TV viewings, Paul reminds us of them in order to teach us some deeper truths. Now last week we did take a good look at Adam. He was not only the one who started humanity off in life as the first man created by God, but he was also the one who started the rot, the patient zero of the sin of vi the virus of sin. Yet God brought the cure, the second Adam, Jesus, who never gave in to temptation, and who was always perfectly obedient. And in him we have life, abundant life, life in all its fullness, eternal life. And today, Abraham makes his return, not as the one who led us away from faith like Adam, but as the one who models it for us. <coughs> and using his example, Paul will show us what it takes to obtain Jesus' gift of righteousness. Or to put it another way, his gift of a right standing with God. So let's go back to the Old Testament to remember who Abraham was. And we started with our first reading in Genesis chapter 12. Let me remind you. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. So that's the account of Abraham in Genesis 12. And pretty much out of the blue, God had spoken to Abraham. And he made him these really big promises that he would bless him, that he would make him a blessing to others, that he would give him a land to live in, and that he would grow him into a nation. And without hesitation, Abram set off. Now don't be fooled by the economy of words. That was not an easy choice for Abraham to make. God points out in verse 1 that there is a very real cost. He's given up his country, his people, and his wider family. And that's pretty much the whole of his existence. His place, his people, his family. And for what? To go somewhere he's never even seen. You know, we have the programmes on the television of people looking to buy a new house and they get to look round, don't they? Whether it's in this country or abroad. 
the presenter shows them this will be the perfect place for you and they have a little look round, don't they and they go and see the next one have a little look round, and eventually they choose well Abraham I'm going to give you a land go to it yeah Abraham took God at his word and went I wonder how many of us would do the same perhaps some of you have and you know the sacrifice that's called for but you'll also know the excitement setting out with God is a thrill think of when we started the project here at St Peter's the diggers came in the land was leveled old walls came down the new walls started to come up it's an exciting dynamic and the first few months as a Christian can be like that too it's a new adventure we see the world through fresh eyes but before long you can guarantee that troubles and doubts will set in the project here it's it was will the grant funders pay up for a while we were looking into a hundred thousand pound black hole which kept me awake at night I can tell you in our own lives you might say why is there opposition why is there trouble to deal with all the time now for Abraham his issue was his lack of children see God had blessed him just as he'd promised and they were living in the land of Canaan but there was this one problem he was getting on in years and Sarah was well past the menopause how could they possibly have children now he might be able to manage it at a push with a good wind behind him but Sarah certainly couldn't who ever heard of an octogenarian as she was at that point bearing a child <coughs> so Abraham took his concerns to God just as any of us should when these things happen these worries these concerns these questions come to us take them to God and we read about God's conversation with Abraham in Genesis 15 Abraham said sovereign Lord what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus and Abraham said you have given me no children so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So God answered Abraham and he answered by clearly restating the original promise and then just developing it a little bit not just a child but uncountable descendants you can imagine Abraham looking up at the dark night sky without light pollution and seeing the stars going on endlessly and crucially Abraham believed verse 6 Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness and it's this faith that God will keep his promises that Paul picks up on in our reading from Romans 4 now the big question Paul is tackling in this part of the letter is how do we get right with God or to phrase it in the terms of last week's sermon, how do we receive God's gift of life made possible by the second Adam's obedience? And Paul makes three assertions in our verses today. It'd be good to look down at them there in Romans 4 as we follow the passage 3. It's not by merit. It's not by privilege. It's a gift. We're going to explore each of those. It's not by merit. Now that may well make you sit up and feel a little bit indignant. 
Because merit is what counts, isn't it? Our whole system of life is based around earning our rights. You work hard at school to get your qualifications so you can go on to university or work. You work hard in your job so that you can earn money for a mortgage. You pay into your pension so that you can have a comfortable retirement. This is how life works. We train our children in the same way. Good behaviour earns a treat. And because that's how we see life, we assume that's also how God works. But it's not. Romans 4.4 4. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. That's true, isn't it? When we go to work, we earn the wage. If our employer doesn't cough up our wage, then we can take him to court and hopefully make him pay. That's how it works. But being right with God isn't something that we can earn. It's a gift from a loving God. Now we might ask, but what if I'm really, really good? Then surely I deserve to be right with God. What if I follow all the rules? And you might hear folks saying that. They might say, I've been a good person, never harmed anyone, always done my best. Now generally the people who say this have never actually read or understood God's law because it's far reaching. So far reaching that we can't actually keep it all perfectly. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 which Jesus also picks up in the New Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Well, there's a lot of alls going on there, isn't there? This isn't just doing a bit. It's not even doing a lot. It's loving God and serving God with all of ourselves all of the time. Do you love God like that? No one does. So if you're trusting in your own merits, then think again. Paul says back in Romans 4.14, for if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. He's saying actually we can't keep the law as we need to be able to do. And so what we earn isn't the prize, we earn the punishment, the penalty for not keeping it. That's where merit gets you. And of course, if you could earn it, then that would put God in a position of debt to us. Which is impossible. God can't be in debt to us. He's given us our life, our breath and everything else. So that's merit. What about merit's evil opposite, privilege? And we hear a lot about challenging privilege today. And as someone from a working class background, I've always pushed back against those who get to places in life because of their family connections, inherited wealth, jobs for the boys. I think surely God doesn't do that. Well, the first century Jews thought he did. They believed that simply being from the bloodline of Abraham was enough. But Jesus himself challenged that view. Matthew 3, 9. Do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So it's not by privilege. Paul says in verses 16 and 17, that it's by having the faith of Abraham that we are included. And what was Abraham's faith? He believed God would keep his promises. 
later on in the chapter, we get it explained more, verses 20 and 21. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Let me say that again, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And that's what living faith is. Being fully persuaded God will do what he said he's going to do. And in this context, the promise we're thinking about is the promise of the cure of our sin in Jesus. So we don't earn it by merit. We don't get it because of our ancestry or our privilege. God offers it to us as a gift. And that's our third point. It's a gift. Now a gift out of the blue is lovely. But sometimes it can make us a little bit uncomfortable. A birthday gift is fine. It's our birthday. So long as it's not out of proportion with what we bought the giver for their birthday. A wedding gift is fine too. After all, we've likely spent thousands upon thousands on the reception that, that person's been invited to. But a big gift out of the blue, that can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. How can we pay back this person for the gift? Is there a catch to the gift that we're being given? God's gift is not like that. It does not have a catch. We don't have to repay it. We can't earn it. It's a gift from God's loving and generous heart. But just as we have to pick up the bunch of flowers to take them home and put them in the vase and enjoy them, or to take the key of the new car and turn it in the ignition to be able to drive it, so we have to receive God's gift by actively trusting that he will keep his word. And that's within the scope of anyone. But most people will ignore the gift. They'll deny it's there. Or they'll even look at it with scorn. And they won't get to enjoy the gift. Will you? It's good to ask these questions of ourselves. It's good at Lent to ask these questions of ourselves. Am I stuck in a merit-based salvation? Thinking I'm good enough because I go to church, read my Bible, do my best. I'm okay. I don't need anything else. Or maybe do I rely on my privilege? I've been coming to this church all my life. My parents and grandparents were stalwarts of the church. Of course everything's okay. Or ask, have I really grasped the love of God? The love of God who gives life to the dead, who calls into being things that are not, who forgives every sin, however bad. And if, have I received this gift of life by trusting that it's real, that Jesus has won eternal life for me, that my future's safe, that I will be his forever. Those are really big questions to ask, and those are questions which can quite simply change your life around. So don't leave the gift on the shelf. Or in church. Receive that gift today and enjoy that life with God that Jesus died for you to have. Well, a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you for this gift of new life with you, this gift of full forgiveness, the gift of your Holy Spirit to shape us and change us and equip us. Oh, forgive us when we've tried to make ourselves good enough for that gift. 
forgive us when we've tried to, to state the reasons why we should have it. Oh, forgive us when we've not taken your gift seriously. When we thought it sounds too good to be true. Oh, help us to come in faith, to have faith like Abraham had. To know that you've made your promises and you will keep them. And so know the love and peace that comes from receiving that gift. So help each one of us, we pray, to have a clear view of ourselves and the confidence and faith of Abraham. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand, shall we, and declare our faith together before God.